Good afternoon to one and all present here. Our guest today for the Leadership Lecture Series, Professor Vyash Shekhar, is an inspiration to all of us. Scientist, academician, tech entrepreneur are just some of the words that describe him. His accomplishments in the field of computer science are broadly at the intersection of computer networks, systems, and security. Also, his contribution with specialized work in intersections of networking, security, and systems are world renowned. Professor Vyash Shekhar is the Tan Family Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the EC department at Carnegie Mellon University. He is also the Chief Scientist at Conviva and a co-founder at the Rockface Data. Professor Vyas received his B.Tech from IIT Madras where he received the President of India Gold Medal and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. He has advised more than 20 PhD students and postdoctoral scholars who, who have gone on to leading positions in academia and industry. His research has been recognized with numerous awards, including the ACM SICCOM Rising Star Award, NSA Science of Security Prize, SICCOM Test of Time Award, Intel Outstanding Researcher Award, and numerous Best Paper Awards. He was awarded the Young Alumni Achiever Award by our Institute for his achievements and contributions towards scientific innovation. Now let us all welcome our professor to take over the stage. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it always it's funny to hear your own bio in third person. So uh, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. I think as I walked in, I think uh, Professor uh, NS was asking me why am I giving this meta talk, right? So uh, why not a technical talk? Most professors who come, most academics who come, want to talk about their work. I want to talk about the recent paper I wrote or a recent paper my student wrote. Here's a cool new res result that I had. But the more and more I think about it is like everybody in this room, I actually think that uh, you are extremely technically capable of solving any problem that is thrown at you. That is not the problem, right? So, but what I find more and more when I talk to students, in my own PhD students, uh, and even in like, uh, when I talk to people in like different companies and so on, uh, what I notice is that, what I've noticed over time is this pattern where many people fall into the same kind of pitfalls and these are like meta pitfalls, not so much that they are technically incapable of solving a problem or uh, formulating a problem, but they often fall into these like, like blind spots of, of not solving the right problem or not solving the problem in the right way. So, and I, I over time, as I said, I've advised like 20 plus PhD students and, 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 and postdocs, and I've seen this pattern and I felt myself giving the same advice over and over again to everybody. Right? Every time somebody comes and says, hey, I'm going to work on a project. I ask them the same questions, right? Every time somebody says, I'm going to make a presentation for a conference, I give the same feedback. So the question is, now, think about, we are, in the level, we are in the world of like AI and GPT, right? So the question was like, what if I became a GPT, right? You can, you can simulate me and say, you don't need me anymore. What if I can just make it an advice and say, here is what simulation of what Vyas would say, if you came to me with a project proposal, if you came with me an idea, or if you came with me uh, uh, with a presentation. So this slide deck or this meta talk, is that attempt. It's not so much a technical advice, so it's not like, hey, work on this problem, here are the cool new technologies, here's a cool new result, but what I would call like a meta talk. It's more about like the, the philosophy or the art or the, the art of science as opposed to the science itself. And uh, this is one of those talks where I feel like there's accumulated wisdom from many, many generations and many, many eminent scholars far better than I ever will be. So this is an attempt at distilling through my experiences and the advice I give to students uh, some uh, guidelines uh, for uh, this meta philosophy of like research and product engineering uh, that I think is very valuable, uh, potentially, hopefully, you, you, you can tell me if it's useful. And I wish somebody had given me this advice 20 years ago when I started off in grad school, right? Uh, if somebody had given me this advice 20 years in grad school, I feel like, okay, I wouldn't have spent seven years in grad school. I spent seven years doing my PhD. So, so those of you doing a PhD, it can't take that long, it's okay. I spent seven years doing my PhD, but if maybe if somebody had given me this advice, I wouldn't have spent seven years in PhD. It could have been much efficient and much more productive, but then I had a lot of fun and I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, so here's, here's, here's this attempt at distilling that wisdom, not my own, uh, mostly sort of a, a, a distilling of diverse sources of wisdom. Uh, as is customary, I heard this is like quiz week or mid-semester mid week or something. So I will start with the pop quiz. So I don't think you expected to see that. Uh, so here's like four uh, eminent scientists, computer scientists, economists, uh, computer engineers, 
uh, mathematicians and so on. So pop quiz for this crowd. Uh, do any of you recognize the pictures on this slide? You can also take a picture, put it in Google images and ask to an image search too. That also is okay. Any guesses? I can give you a hint for this person. This is the only person, as far as I know, who has a Turing Award, which is the highest honor in computer science, and a Nobel Prize in economics. This is unique. Not many people have a Turing Award or a, sorry, John Nash has a Nobel Prize but not a Turing Award, unfortunately. He's not that good. He's good but not that good. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Juan Nyman. I don't think he has a uh, no. I don't think he has a Turing Award either. No, good guess. Uh, I can give another. Sorry, he did the he did the spectrum allocation. No, so he's actually con con considered the father of like modern AI. Uh, did a lot of the early chess programs. Was at Carnegie Mellon, the first computer science person. Uh, sorry, Simon. Thank you. So this is Herb Simon. Uh, so, legendary, inspirational, uh, world-renowned economist who won the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics for his theory of organizational behavior and the Turing Award for his contributions to AI. Actually, the only person I believe who has won uh, both. Uh, so, this, uh, many of you have probably read it. Read it. It's probably a, it's a very popular book uh, in the IIT hostels, at least used to be. Uh, how many of you have read this book called How to Solve It? Nari, only one person. Oh man, you should, all of you should read that book. <laughs> we should buy these books and say, this is uh, George Polya, How to Solve It. Again, uh, very, very eminent Hungarian mathematician, sort of, I think, uh, early days of graph theory had like some like, foundational results. Uh, but the less known factor, he has this wonderful book called How to Solve It, which is like a meta advice on how to go about problem solving. That's George Polya. Uh, how many of you work on computer architecture or parallel programs? Anybody working on parallel computing, supercomputing, computer architecture? Nobody? Wait, nobody works on computer architecture anymore? Seriously? Okay. Uh, this is Amdahl, Gene Amdahl from the early days of supercomputing. If you heard of Amdahl's law, every computer system course has taught you Amdahl's law. That is Amdahl from Amdahl's law. Uh, this one's the hardest one. Probably most people have not heard of this person because it does not have like this uh, sort of like uh, foundational result in computing or so on. But he's actually been pretty influential uh, in the computing community. So that's a person called... Uh, George Heilmeier. So Heilmeier actually used to be at DARPA. So DARPA was a defense advanced program agency. So this is the equivalent of the modern, like the, the, the funding agency in India that funds all of the great research that we do out here. Like most of your PhDs, most of your funding comes through sort of federal grants. He was actually at DARPA. So DARPA funded the internet, DARPA funded AI, DARPA funded all of the revolutionary breakthroughs in computer science through grand challenge problems. So he was the program manager. So he was the guy in charge of de deciding what gets funded, right? So what problems should people be working on? So he had this uh, ability to really sort of give people advice on what to work on. He's not himself the computer scientist who's doing the work, but he has a knack of figuring out what to fund, okay? So pop quiz answers are Heilmeier, uh, Gene Amdahl, George Polya, Herb Simon. And that's basically the outline of my talk. So it's my advice to you distilled through their advice that they gave to a lot of people. Okay? So the part one of this advice is from the program manager at DARPA, George Heilmeier. And Heilmeier had a very, very simple rule. Right? So every day, if you're a program manager at one of these agencies, your job is basically painful. Everybody is coming and pitching random ideas to you. It's like, so I mean, many, many, many of you probably want to do like a startup or go to venture capital and so on. It's the same thing. People constantly come at you and pitch ideas to you and you have to figure out a way of figuring out what is signal and what is noise. So high my job is to figure out what is signal, what is noise and what to fund. So he came up with, with his own sort of guidebook on what he thought were good projects and what he thought were like uh, projects that had a good chance of success. So this is called the Heilmeier catechism or the Heilmeier questions. And at the end of the day, most of the, the thing about a lot of these sort of advice or meta advice, if you say it is like, once you see it, it's like blindingly obvious, right? It's one of those things that are like, in hindsight, so obvious that it's like, why didn't I think of it? But that's what their advice was. So, so Heilmeier catechism, so anybody, somebody comes to him and says, hey, give me like whatever, $1 million or 1 crore rupees to fund my uh, fancy new uh, idea. He would ask them some very basic set of questions, right? And these are the questions. That's it, right? 
the first thing you would ask the person is tell me what you are trying to do without using any jargon right can you explain what you are trying to do to me sort of a generalist program manager without using like crazy jargon or acronyms right at least i come from the way, uh, area of like uh, computer networking and we are absolutely guilty of using crazy three letter acronyms that mean nothing right everybody starts talking in networking it will be some tcp sdn nfp all sorts of crazy jargon that mean nothing to the outside world and even inside the world it doesn't make sense outside the world it doesn't definitely does not make sense so first question is like articulate what you are trying to do without any jargon the second thing you would ask is very simple is how is it done today right if it's so important a problem clearly somebody is thinking about it how is it done today and what are the limits of the status quo what are the limits of current practice third question clearly you want some money for doing something what is new in your approach right you got to have something new maybe you have found some new hardware maybe you found some new algorithm maybe you found some measurement something new in your approach and why do you think you will be successful when those people who tried before you have failed the fourth question in fact i would actually maybe put the fourth question at, at, at the second question or the first question is like who cares if you are insanely successful at the end of your project what difference will it make to the world or what difference will it make to somebody maybe you built a one building a quantum computer so what right why is it why is it useful for the world <laughs> then you would ask questions about logistics like what are the risks how much will it cost how long will it take and what are the midterm and final exams for your success now if you squint at these questions you will actually realize now you got a formula for any, any paper introduction you ever want to write right this is like what are you trying to do status quo related work background what is your approach why do you think this is going to work what is the metric of success how did you advance the state of the art it is also the recipe for you ever coming up with a thesis proposal a project proposal a project plan for anything you want to do right if you say oh i am going to come up with a new idea i want to go pitch my advisor on this clever new idea that i have i have read all this related work this is a good template for you to follow articulate your answers to these questions before you go talk to your advisor or before you talk to a vc or whatever right who are you trying to pitch your idea to can you answer the heilmeier questions in simple words for yourself okay so so how do you internalize that is very simple before you embark on any research project or a startup idea or whatever you want to do or any even like a local project inside your thing ask yourself the heilmeier questions write down answers to those questions again don't write like sort of long paragraph or one page answers you should be give like succinct answers in like three four sentences for each of those questions if you are able to do that you have internalized the essence of what the problem you are trying to solve and why you think you will be successful okay and not every time you will get a linear answer in the sense that as you learn more about the problem as you get like more understanding of the related work or insights about the data you are looking at you have to periodically revisit maybe your assumptions or hypothesis are proven wrong you come back and say uh maybe i have to pivot if the evidence says that my approach is actually not that successful right maybe i went on a particular algorithm for doing it and that algorithm turns out to be not working in practice okay so this is like part one basically before you ever start a new project go look up the heilmeier questions write down answers for yourself and sanity check by explaining it to somebody else right it's very easy for you to think about oh i came up with this very clever idea but the question is what problem is it actually solving and are you actually improving the status quo right in hindsight these are like hindsight hindsight obvious questions but asking yourself is very important so i saw this problem every single time right i have like class projects in my class right students would keep coming out with like paper ideas right even like uh, many people in engineering are trying to solve some problem and often times they actually are very, they struggle to articulate what problem they are trying to solve why they are trying to solve it what is the metric of success and so on right if they go through this process it can short circuit a lot of those things and make them a lot more efficient in what they are trying to do right so it also helps you understand okay why what's new in my approach right that's actually a great question to ask yourself why it's, why it's new and why you think you will be successful okay so that's part 1 hail meyer uh so this is part 2 uh second piece of advice again from uh, jean andal uh, anybody heard of andal's law from computer architecture parallel systems one person i on one second person do you want to take a stab at answering what is andal's law or uh, explain in your own words what is andal's law
okay all right so let me repeat that uh, answer so the the point about Andal's law is actually in the, in the area of like parallel computing and it says that how much should you invest in parallelizing a particular program or a particular process and you need to understand the value add of that particular program or that component your overall system okay so Andal's law very simple to state uh, the overall improvement gained by optimizing any single part of a system and again this is the early, year, uh, early years of supercomputing and parallel computing and they are all trying to figure out how to like milk the maximum performance from all these like parallel architectures insight is very blindingly obvious the overall performance improvement you will gain from any single part of a system is limited by the fraction of time that overall system is used end to end right so you could say oh here is a function that i can go optimize i can do like 10x optimization of this function but that function only contributes like 0.1% of your end to end time your effort is wasted right your return of investment in finding a clever data structure a clever algorithm a clever optimization a parallel routine a gpu routine for that part of, part of the program is wasted if it is such a small contributor to our end to end performance okay so by the way i mean, i come from computer systems but i think that's a lot of these inspirations come from there but if you actually think about it this applies to pretty much every aspect of our everyday life it's not just specific to computer systems so here is andal's law visually this is actually one of those graphs and basically says that uh, the y axis is the speed up is how much you can speed up a program compared to running on a single processor the x axis is the number of processors you have right how much sort of resources you have and the different curves show the speed up as a function of how how much the program is actually parallelizable right it's basically saying if you have a program that's only like 50% parallelizable you hit diminishing returns very very soon there is no point adding 8000 processors or 8000 cores to a program when only 50% of it is parallelizable right similarly if it is like a significantly parallelizable like say 95 uh, 95% parallelizable you get a lot of value right so this question is thinking about any problem you are working on find the elephant in the room almost always there is like one significant piece of the problem that's the bottleneck find that as soon as possible and focus your energy and efficiency or your effort on that piece of the problem because that's the one that's going to give you the maximum return of investment in your time and effort spent right you could spend a lot of time optimizing like a finding a super clever data structure or a super clever algorithm for something that is like intellectually very stimulating but the, at the end of the day that might be a very small component of your end to end system so you should figure out where to where to invest your effort so uh, a corollary of this at least in the computer systems world and actually any kind of like performance optimization world is actually this uh, from this uh, classic paper in computer systems by butler lamson again also a turing award winner uh, so this is from his classic paper called hints for computer system design so he makes uh, the very simple case if you are ever building a product if you are building an engineering system uh, profile and measure where that system is spending most of its time or effort or cost right and his insight which is actually somewhat universally true is like for most programs that he has seen or they have seen that 80% of the time this is like a, another manifestation of the 80 20 rule or the pareto rule that you've seen in many many domains that 80% of the time is often spent by 20% of the code right so if you find that 20% of the code and invest your effort in trying to optimize it parallelize it use a gpu use like some fpga use like some clever uh, data structure that's what you should find uh, now sometimes you have an intuition but you are better off with actual data right so use profiling tools liberally when you're building a tool debugging a tool uh, use those kind of like debugging prof profiling tools to identify the pieces of your program and this also can apply to many aspects of your everyday life too right so imagine you are trying to become more efficient in like how you read a paper how you present systems how you present something else uh, figure out where you are spending most of your time and figure out a way to make that piece of the bottleneck more efficient right so that's sort of the uh, uh, part number 2 is how to internalize it for yourself is whatever you are trying to do right i'm trying to solve this particular problem try to see if there is like one significant bottleneck elephant in the room type problem that you should be solving right and that's where you should actually focus your effort on because you could be solving the like the mouse problem that even if you solve it and you come up with the most clever idea for it the end to end impact of that is going to be very minimal okay so those of you building systems or or working on anything right even if you're working on algorithms you're working on machine learning this is this is very useful for you 
figure out where the biggest bottleneck is, the biggest pain point for, for existing systems are. So, uh, part two is so the first part is like specify or uh, write down the problem. Second part is once you identify the problem, find the elephant in the room that you want to solve. The third part, this is where the uh, George Palia's brilliance comes in, is how to solve this problem, right? I have now identified this problem, right? I, I, I identified a broad area to work on. I have identified one particular problem that is the elephant in the room, where I get the maximum return of investment for what I do. So now, do I, how do I actually go about solving it? Now, this is kind of where your creative spirits come in, right? How do you creatively solve a new problem you've never seen before? And the, the, the brilliance of Paul Yaz basically is that he wrote this book called How to Solve It. I would say it's a must read. So if you go find it in the library, uh, there's probably what PDFs on the internet also of this book. Uh, he does not say how to solve a particular problem. He kind of give you a meta recipe or a meta algorithm for how to solve any problem you've ever seen. Right? So you can, you can sort of keep applying it to yourself, applying it to any problem you see and that's a meta algorithm for how to solve a problem. And he basically says that there is a four step approach, understand the problem, make a plan, carry out the plan and then reflect on what you did and see whether there is a better way to do it or whether there is a generalization or a better optimization and so on. So step one, the first step and actually we struggle with this, we actually jump to a solution before we understand the problem. This is actually a, a common pitfall I see with students, with engineers everywhere is you jump to finding a solution but you can't articulate, okay, basic stuff, what is the input? What is the output of your problem? What is the objective function? Right? What are you trying to optimize? If you can explain the problem formulation in like input, output, here's a box I'm trying to build. That box has these characteristics or qualitative features or quantifiable metrics I care about. Can you state that? So think about what are you asked to find or show. Again, he, he gave these advice in the, con in the context of like algebraic or geometric problems, but it applies to every aspect of problem solving we will see in life. What I was to find or show, can you restate the problem in your words? Can you draw a picture, right? Maybe it's a graph problem, maybe it's a tree problem, maybe it's a, a network problem, maybe it's a router problem, right? Maybe it's a data structure problem. Can you think of a picture that might help you understand the problem? Is there enough information to find a solution? Sometimes your problem is ill-defined because you don't have like some auxiliary variables or auxiliary information you need to solve the problem. Are you using all the information that in, 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 the, in the given problem? Uh, do you need to ask more questions to refine the problem and get more information from whoever gave you the problem, right? Especially in research, right? So this is not a homework. So this is, this is often the difference between like uh, where innovation and sort of class, classroom homework problems are different. Innovation problems, research problems are open-ended. 90% of the battle is sort of formulating the right problem and formulating the problem that is like hard, interesting and solvable. That intersection is very, very hard for to find out. This is where understanding the problem is super critical. And in homework problems, oftentimes you know the answer. I mean, unless, unless your prof is tricking you and giving you an open problem as a homework problem, which can happen. Most of the time, homework problems, we know there is a solution. We know how to get there. It's just you have to come, come and kind of repeat the steps. But most of you who are like research scholars writing papers and so on, there is both the problem and the solution are both ill-defined. So sometimes you have to solve and define, refine, scope out the problem before you can even make progress. So part two, he says, device a plan of attack. And this is, I find this table very, very interesting. Uh, you don't have to look at all of this stuff, but and you can find this in the book. Basically, he says that there is not that many different patterns of problem solving that we use as humans, right? Sometimes you say, okay, let me simplify the problem. Let me make a simplifying assumption and see if I can solve the problem. That's one approach. Second problem is, have I seen this problem before? Can I pattern match it to a previous problem I've already seen? Somehow visually pattern match or like globally pattern match, something. Uh, can I use some additional information to simplify? Can I use some auxiliary elements and add some new elements to solve this problem? Can I solve a variation of this problem? Can you look at a few examples, solve the examples and then build some intuition? This is like solving by induction, right? Can I, can I build an inductive reasoning for solving this problem? Uh, can I solve a more specialized problem? Can I modularize this problem and say, hey, okay, maybe this is too problem is too hard. Can I modularize it and decompose it into like sub problems and make progress on each sub problem? Uh, this happens in mathematics, this happens in every aspect of computer science, happens in every aspect of engineering. Uh, draw a figure, very, very useful to uh, understand how to devise a plan of attack. So this is like a sort of a meta recipe, right? Any problem you are given, uh, now there is some creativity in finding the right tools and the right 
capabilities and the right formulation. But oftentimes, if you actually squint and look at it, the idea that you have is often the same thing, right? Oh, I can map it to a problem in graph theory, I already know. I can map this to a problem in networking, I already know. Or in, in my case, I've seen, I've seen examples where I hear of this very clever idea in machine learning, I see a very clever idea in like algorithms or, or data structures, and I say, oh, my problem in cybersecurity or networking is very similar to the problem that these people are solving in machine learning or algorithms, and maybe I can borrow from them. I don't need to be that clever. Somebody smarter than me has found the answer. I just need to connect the dots. Right? And often there's very, very interesting innovation in connecting the dots, finding the sort of the interdisciplinary uh, applications across boundaries. And the last part is carry out the plan. So you have a plan of attack. You kind of figure out how to solve the problem, process with the plan you have chosen, but then in a lot of times in like product engineering or other kinds of stuff or in startups, you actually want to fail early. Right? Figure out the shortest path to failure and then pivot and reason why did that, why they didn't fail, do a post-mortem and then sort of discard it and, and pick another plan. The last part, which I think is very, very useful and a lot of students I see don't do it is uh, this happens especially after like say a big deadline or a big paper submission or a thesis submission and so on, right? And you're like, oh, I'm like grand success, I've solved this problem, but this is actually the best time for you to reflect and say, hey, if I had like one more week, if I had one more month, what else would I have done to make this a lot better? Would I have done this a lot more efficiently, right? Oftentimes, we get into this deadline mindset, which is great. It's a good forcing function to get stuff done. But then the week or two after the deadline is actually to me the most productive period because your mind is still fresh thinking about what you did reflect back and say, hey, I took a particular approach, maybe I should have tried something else, or maybe I can generalize this, maybe I can uh, improve this further, I can optimize this further. So do that post-mortem and reflect and find op op opportunities to improve or generalize the solution you came up with. So, uh, so don't get like, complacent as soon as you solve the problem, that immediate period after that might actually be the most productive for you to find the next thing you want to do. Right? The next thing is, hey, look, I solved this problem, but now I can solve a generalization of this problem. I can apply it to other domains, right? Or I can build a better tool for this and so on. Okay. So, so hopefully at this point, where we are in our journey is we've identified a broad area to work on. We've identified and formulated a specific problem to work on, right? Where the biggest ROI is going to be. And hopefully we applied polya tricks to solve the problem. So at this point, you've solved the problem, right? And now you have to either write the paper or you have to present this talk at a conference, right? And uh, this is where Herb Simon's uh, advice is extremely important. So, way back when, in 1970, so he was coming up with this theory. He, he, so, his Nobel Prize was in a different topic uh, on, uh, it's called like sort of uh, bounded rationality, but he's also known for this other topic called attention economics. So, this is in his own words. Uh, so, don't we have to read all of that, but the, the, the essence of it is basically saying that Today, and I don't know how many of you are like on your laptops or your phones and so on, we are actually living in a, a data information rich world. You are constantly bombarded with like random interruptions, random information and so on. Now, in that world, and he actually saw this coming in 1970, right? Before the era, era, era of TikTok, before the era of Instagram, before email, before everything, he saw it coming, right? It's like saying, we live in a world where information is abundant. Now, what happens if information is abundant is that it consumes a particular resource. That resource becomes the scarcest resource. And that resource is your attention, the human attention. Right? When information becomes rich and easy to create, and we're actually going to go into that era right now, right? Generating content has never been easier. Right? You can put some prompt into GPT, it will it will spin up like a whole text, right? Or Sora will generate videos for you. So generation has become super easy. Now the question is that it creates a scarcity of attention as a corollary. And now, in that era, how do your work stand out? So, how do you make your work stand out? Right, right now, if you're in like machine learning, every day in archive, there's like thousands and thousands of papers being written. Right? I can't keep up. No way I can keep up. So, how do you actually figure out and be the signal amidst that noise? How do you actually make sure that your work, when you give a talk, when you actually write your paper, that your work stands out? Is for you to really think about having some empathy for your attention, for your reader. Have the empathy for your listener and try to find a succinct distillation of what you are trying to do in anything, any communication you ever do. So, uh, here's a favorite quote of mine from Mark Twain, is, uh, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. So, this is what GPT would have done, right? You can say, stop generating, like, generating noise at this point, right? 
if i really thought about it i will give you a one line answer but because of that i'm just going to give you like verbal like give you like an like a verbal outrage so for anything you are trying to think about right if you are trying to make slides you're trying to write an email to somebody you're trying to give a talk at a meeting right or even setting up a meeting with your advisor really really think about the scarcest resource in that setting whether it's a talk like in this room how do i make sure you are not on tiktok maybe okay maybe some attendance is going on i don't know what's going on right how do i make sure you are not on tiktok i have to be engaging enough i have to be interesting enough and there has to be something of value to you right same thing when i'm writing a paper right and this happens all the time so many of you try to write papers to all these top conferences you should actually have a mental model of like the the attention span of the person reading that paper if you are like mtech ms phd scholars so here is the what actually happens in a conference so suppose i am on a program committee or a journal reviewing your submission okay i have like 30 or 40 papers in my pile i have to read okay and then four months after i read there is a committee discussion or an editorial board discussion that says hey which paper should be accept which paper should be reject so now three months after i have read like 30 papers and i'm constantly reading papers i have to somehow remember your paper from three months ago and try and explain and convince my sort of other committee members why this paper is interesting why this paper is novel why this paper solved a hard problem okay so somehow you should if you leave all of that as an exercise to the reader your paper is never going to get in right so if you have empathy for your audience you should say here is the mental model of a reviewer of, of a reader or imagine even like blogs or other kinds of stuff the same thing right uh, everybody is reading a lot how do you make sure what you have written stands out for them which means that you have to take the extra effort to write succinctly write clearly and articulate your contribution to the world okay such that 3 months from now when they want to be your champion in that program committee meeting in the editorial board meeting they can articulate your contribution very very clearly right now yes of course details matter and all that stuff is good and they will figure out the details once they get to it but most of the battle is actually being able to get to the high order bits of why this work is interesting why this work solved a hard problem what is the interesting breakthrough because of which the work was interesting right so think about that for yourself okay all right so putting it together is your end to end sort of here is a cheat sheet for your any research process your startup process anything you ever want to do use the heilmeier catechism to articulate your goals use the andal law to find identify the elephant in the room what should i be working on right your time while you are here or wherever you are is the most precious resource so you better be investing your time in solving the biggest problem <coughs> and the most impactful problem use the polio methodology to formulate solve refine reflect on what you have done and then use sort of the herb simon philosophy of how you can best articulate your idea to the audience okay now of course i've given you a nice linear model of this process the truth is the research process the innovation process is a lot more chaotic you have to do a bunch of refinements and cross cross edges and so on but the first order approximation this is the process heimer and <coughs> and all polya and then simon right if you can follow this advice for whatever you want to do whether you want to make a startup whether you want to do a project inside a company whether you actually want to write a paper or a thesis this is kind of like a cheat sheet for life okay uh so here my takeaways right so for any new current project startup pitch and so on write a heilmeier doc for any process performance bottleneck profile that system profile your own process identify the high order bits and the big wins use the polio methodology to formulate refactor visualize problems in input or output and then finally think about the simon methodology of saying how do i have empathy for the audience's attention that will make you a bet much better communicator and your ideas to stick okay uh any questions before i segue into the next part let me pause here any questions on this the the meta research process questions comments is it useful okay thank you that's it is useful uh any questions you should have questions by the way i'm i'm, I'm proposing this as if it's like a universal answer it is not right it's just it's like it's like there's this famous quote that all models are wrong but some models are useful so this model is likely wrong but this model might be useful right no questions question thank you yes
Yeah. Uh, no, great point. So, uh, so two things. I, one thing you said, right? So one thing I, I'll comment on two things you said. One is like I totally agree. It's not exactly a linear process. It's like a cyclic process. You're whiteboarding with yourself and so on. Now, the second part I would disagree a little bit. You said like oftentimes the audience is yourself. Now, the fastest way to make progress in like grad school or startup or any kind of thing. It's like the equivalent of like pair programming. Your advisor is kind of like a pair programmer for you, right? You're kind of using them as a sanity check of your ideas. Like, is this like BS or is this true? Is this signal or is this noise? And actually, one thing somebody told me in in my own grad school, which is actually uh, stuck with me for life, is this is actually a very useful exercise. Find a random person outside of your community, right? Another PhD student in the in the department, master student, or somebody else who is not in your community, right? Not in your lab. Go find them over coffee or tea or whatever. Explain what you're working to them, right? And be that sounding board, and vice versa. You can sort of do this pad programming for yourself. Hey, tell me what you're working on. I'll tell you what I'm working on, right? And that's the easiest way for you to like sort of refine your refine your uh, methodology, refine your pitch, right? Constantly keep doing the elevator pitch to other persons. Now, yes, there is a solitary time where you have to like really think and distill the essence. But then once you converge a little bit, don't just stick stick to the convergence. At that convergence, go a little bit of like. Get feedback from an outside party, so you're not in your own echo chamber. Any other questions on this? Good, good question. Yeah, it's, it's not. A, I mean, it's a very abstracted, simplified model of the research process. A lot, often times, a lot more chaotic, right? You solve the problem, you get stuck, and then you go back and say, yeah, "Let me restate and refine the problem." That's often, often times, what happens. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's like the the second part, which is actually a nice segue. Uh, from the herb Simon. Oh, question. Sorry. Yes. Ah, uh, great question. Uh, when do you know it's time to go back? Uh, that is often comes with like some kind of wisdom or a judgment call. That's very very hard. Uh, and uh, sometimes where this is your advisor can help you. Right? They've seen patterns where they, you're stuck on a very hard problem. And sometimes you have to they have to pull you out of the weeds and say, hey, maybe let's perturb you a little bit to get unstuck there, right? Uh, but sometimes actually persevering through that like a brick wall is actually very helpful, right? You say maybe you hit like some local point, but then persevering through that problem might actually give you a breakthrough. So that's a very tricky question to answer in the abstract sense. I think it's on a case by case basis. You have to see whether okay, hey, do I have a deadline? Do I have something else, right? Now, my personal bias is actually like often that perfect is the enemy of good. You can always solve like a simpler version of the problem or a partial, make partial improvement. And if you're making partial improvement on a hard problem, it is significantly valuable, right? Even if I say I've solved 50% of a very very hard problem, even though I set out to solve 100%, that intermediate win is very valuable to make progress, right? So, yeah. So, I'll give you the corollary to that is like so. This is this famous book about like uh, Fermat's last theorem, right? How Andrew Wiles spent for 11 years in his attic and solved this Fermat's last theorem, right? Maybe like less than 0.0001 percent of the world needs to solve Fermat's last theorem. Most of the world are not in that. Most of us are not in that bucket, right? Most of us are not in Andrew Wiles where we go we need to go to an attic for 11 years and solve that problem. Yes, there are those kinds of problems, but most of the world's problems or most of the research problems we are working on are not in that category. You can often make like incremental, finite progress without having to solve that in incredibly open problem, right? Maybe it's at, at, in your view of the world, it might seem like that. Oh, I'm solving like a Fermat's last theorem level hard problem. But often times you can say, let me question this assumption, let me change this assumption, let me reformulate the problem, and make progress. And along that way, you will actually build intuition and build your own. You're kind of like sharpening your own skills on that problem solving, right? So if you're getting stuck for too long, that's probably a signal that you may want to ref reflect and refine the problem and, and get yourself unstuck a little bit. Sure. As I said, like that's a good model. Again, all models are wrong, but that's some models are useful, right? That's a good model to think about. Maybe you're stuck in a local minima, and this is where your advisor is helpful, right? So one one thing I actually tell people is your your advisor is not like some genius. Your advisor basically has like a few different API calls. One of the API calls is called perturb. You are stuck. You go ping your advisor and say, hey, perturb me, and the advisor will throw some ten random ideas or a friend, advisor, mentor, peer, whatever, right? They throw ten random ideas. Nine of them will be wrong. Maybe one of them is useful. But in the process of thinking about those ten random ideas and random perturbations in your mind, okay, oh, I, I'm stuck in a local mi mi minima. I need to like do something to perturb myself, right? I need some high entropy push to perturb myself. That's where your advisor is helpful. Hey, I'm stuck for too long on this problem, and say, oh, let let's do a whiteboarding, let's do a sounding board. 
and they might say, okay, why don't you do this other thing? And it might be a bad idea. But in the process of coming up, thinking about that bad idea, the bad idea might perturb you out of your where you are stuck. Yeah, good point. That's a good analogy, by the way. Yes. When the work is. Uh, good question. So, yeah, so I, I, good question. So, I, I was really intending this as an advice to PhD students, PhD scholars, or like small teams and so on. Uh, the collaborative groups, I think, will require like a lot more like project management and so on. So, that, uh, that, I, that will require some top level thinking of like how to modularize and project management a little bit. In that essence, and I am not talking about it here, to me, at least in my experience building large systems or building other things, the interfaces are where the problems are, right? You have to figure out, even before you build the modules, fix, pick the interfaces between the modules, right? If you get the interfaces right, chances are you will succeed. If your interfaces are wrong, doesn't matter how the modules are, the mo you will never succeed. So, if you are like decomposing a problem, the interface is where the biggest issue is. I mean, this is not like super profound, but I think that if you are collaborating, you better make sure that that out input is useful for you and so on, right? So, and somebody has to come up with like a design pattern or whether it's like, is it a linear flow? Is it like a cyclical flow? Is it like an iterative flow? So, there has to be some process management that somebody has to do. Uh, yeah, good question. But uh, I, I mostly intended as like, okay, sm small teams, startup teams, or like a, a startup of size one, which is a PhD school student type advice. But great point. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, second part, this is going to be a little bit of a cartoon. Uh, so, this is the segue from Herbert Simon's uh, message or how do you make compelling presentations or compelling demos, right? Say you've, you've actually now, you've done your problem, you've submitted a paper, paper has gotten in, or you've, you've done a startup, startup is going to go somewhere, you have to make a presentation or a pitch or a demo of your startup and so on, okay? Uh, it's intentionally a cartoon and a handwritten cartoon, and there's a reason for it, you'll see why, okay? So the first question is like, how do I, if I have to go give a talk at a conference, if I have to go uh, make something or a presentation, or I have to uh, make, a, make a video or so on, right? How do I make it compelling? How do I make it like engaging for the audience? Now, what would most of you do if you had to start making a presentation? Yeah? It should not be visually monotonous, but okay, good. That's a good advice. But what would you start by doing, right? What's the first thing you would think of doing? Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. So you are, you are trying like a chunk it and make sure it's like visually compelling and visually interesting and there are some interesting chunks. So I was thinking more like more of a mechanics process, right? What would you do? It's like, okay, you have, you have to make a presentation, your paper got in, what would you start doing right now? What would, how would you start? How would most people start? Yeah? You will write a story. Okay. You're already way ahead of the curve, right? Most people, okay, great point. So that's actually where I'm getting to, but most people would not do that. Most people start by opening PowerPoint, right? If I had to, say, I had to make a slide. The first thing I would do is like, oh, let me open PowerPoint on my, on my laptop, right? That's actually the, the default. It's like I go to the tool as opposed to the story, which is you're actually getting to the right question. It's like, that should be your focus, not PowerPoint. Like PowerPoint is a me medium or a tool. Don't use the tool before you have a story. And both of you are getting at the right point, right? You need to internalize your storyline, your pitch, what you want the audience to remember first before you go to the tooling that you're using to say that, okay? Now, a common pitfall, again, is, is again, it's like every, everything I've seen is like, like I, I, I on was in grad school and we, we worked on a couple of papers, I think, together. He's probably heard this from me a bunch of times. It's like, okay, every time you try to make a conference talk, the first version of the talk is going to be extremely terrible. If you're trying to make a thesis talk, a job talk, first version of it is going to be terrible. And the reason is that you actually start by making these tools, you start by making a PowerPoint and to make a story, and you start with saying, what have I done? You actually want to tell people what have I done. Here's my paper, here's my things, here's my like five bullets of the idea of whatever I'm doing and so on. But I would argue, is actually like somebody said there, the, a better way to actually make a compelling presentation is by start with a pen and paper exercise or a whiteboard or a, or a blackboard or whatever you want to call it, right? And there, there is a reason why this thing is a cartoon is I sort of took my own advice. If I had to make this presentation, I will actually start using a whiteboard. In this case, it was an iPad. And let me start by drawing what story I want to say. 
and i would actually say use a whiteboard and a pen and paper to start and articulate your storyboard so if you, this is actually inspiration from the early days of like uh, computer animation from the walt disney days so they didn't have cgi they didn't have computers back then animation was a tedious process so they had to really really refine distill and and figure out what to draw in detail so they had to sketch out the storyboard on like sketches by hand before they decide to draw in the details and actually then uh, put in the put in the frills so we have to do a similar exercise when you actually want to give a compelling presentation is start by using a whiteboard and a pen and paper exercise to draft your storyboard now and there's a reason why by am arguing that we should actually use a whiteboard or a pen and paper and not use a tool like powerpoint i actually believe and again i have nothing against microsoft but uh, that powerpoint or the platforms whether whatever this is this other thing right what is this beamer the latex pdf creator right these tools are terrible they are not meant to to enable you to think or distill the essence of your ideas and they engender complexity because they give you like so many toolbars so many options so many different slide templates and designs and so on but they actually distract from the essence of your story now on the other hand a whiteboard or a paper or a blackboard is actually a very painful medium it's a resource constrained medium that right? i have to write by hand i am not going to write like a paragraph after paragraph that i can copy paste from somewhere else i have to write it by hand and that will force me to get to the essence of what i want to say it focuses what i would call like parsimony right it's a sparse a distilled representation of what you want to say it's a distilled essence of your story and you will not put a wall of text you will not use complex visuals to tell your story right so if you were starting to do powerpoint you start to say okay let me copy paste this graph from the paper or let me copy paste this text or abstract from the paper or let me take this beautiful image and put it in my paper but if you actually did the whiteboard exercise you would not do any of that stuff because you have to write by hand i i cannot write like 100 words on a slide your hand will hurt right so the whiteboard exercise is extremely useful for that the cardinal sin of demos of presentation is people and going back to the mark tain quote right people write a lot on a slide so so this slide i have to make by hand so think about i, I can't write more than like 10 15 words on this right that's it this is all i want to say so there's only like how many words can i count 3 5 8 and plus this quote right and that, that's it i mean even this is like very painful for me to write right when i have to write this by hand is like very painful here is a very simple demo story template for any story you want to say right you think about here is a story template for you if you want to go to a conference talk you want to pitch your startup idea most people start by thinking about their solution whereas i would say start with the problem who is suffering start with the pain point of a user or the community that suffering right so i call it the hair on fire problem so somebody somewhere is having a hair on fire problem maybe their energy co consumption is too high maybe their cloud co cloud cost is too high maybe their network latency is too high or maybe their computation time is too high something right there is a users hair on fire problem and they are frustrated with the status quo right going back to the high mayor questions right the reason you your paper got accepted or your paper is interesting is that you are solving a frustration for a user where they don't like their existing tools right you have come up with a better algorithm a better system you are solving their frustration and then you have a aha moment right oh i have this very clever idea of how to solve this problem that's the light bulb moment and then you have to say okay with this light bulb how do they act how do their life actually become better right solve the end to end problem to make their life easier on how they became happy after your system your tool your algorithm came into play okay so when you for such an interactive exercise for you to think about right suppose you are writing a paper you are writing a problem you are solving a past you are doing a startup pitch can you identify what is the primary pain point of the user of your product your paper or something like that right who is your user who is in the audience right so in this case for me the primary pain point is you and say oh your pain point is like every time i do do a presentation my advisor sends me back because the presentation is not good enough right so you are the pain point you are my user you are my target customer and i want to help you say hey here is a better way to think about how to make a presentation so rough rules of thumb ineffective way is focus on what you have done starting starting off with a generic user scenario not relevant to the customer or have a laundry list of things and jump into detail very quickly right the more effective way is to focus on the user pain so your pain is like okay somebody is like really really irritating you by giving you negative feedback on your presentation and you want to make a better presentation how do i make it customized and understandable to you like make it more relatable to the user as you said right how do i grab their attention make it relatable to them and specific like less is more tell a story 
Now, uh, the second part is to understand and explain what is the frustration with the status quo, right? What tools are they using today? What algorithm are they using today? What is the related work, right? In, in, the, in the case of a research paper, the frustration of the status quo is like there is a related work that is not solving this problem well. That is your frustration, right? What is broken about them and why don't people like it? Right? I don't like, this piece, I don't like this, uh, this piece of software because it is taking too long to load. I don't like this particular system because it is too inefficient. I don't like this algorithm because it has like bad worst case complexity and so on. Okay. Now again, ineffective way is many people want to avoid talking about the current tools. They jump into what they do without talking about the limitations of the status quo or the limitations of straw man solutions uh, or mention a lot of low level details on the current tools. Right? They spend too much time on the details of the current tools. Whereas a better way to do it is to pick concrete examples, ideally you know your user's deployment or a customer's deployment and then you focus on the higher, high order bit of what is broken. So there is often like one essential bit of information that I call the high order bit and focus on that rather than give like a laundry list of like five things in which case, in which five ways in which my paper is better than the related work. Try to identify one or two key high order bits, maybe ideally one on what's different, what's new about my approach that prior work has not solved. The third part is the aha moment, right? Again, you've now established there is a user hair on fire. You've established that they have a frustration with the existing tools, the existing papers are terrible. Now it's your job to tell me, okay, I'm I'm sort of the I'm illuminating, right? I'm giving you the idea. It's the aha moment, is the light bulb moment. And you want to say what is my USP, what is my silver bullet, and why this is going to be a game changer for this community. And usually it's like some metric of success, right? Maybe it makes users' life easier, maybe it reduces cost. Maybe it's a different way of programming. Maybe it's a different way of like searching, right? Everybody is excited about chat GPT, right? It changed the game because it made from search, which was a non-conversational, non-interactive mechanism to actually make it like somewhat interactive and so on, right? That's why we are all excited about GPT, right? Why is that a game changer? So think about that. So here again, an effective way to make a good presentation is to focus on one or two compelling points about your idea. So oftentimes people get into like low level details or like low level nuances to explain what is cool about your work because that might have been what you spent the most amount of time on. So this happens a lot in my area which is computer systems. So where people build a complex system and they want to talk a lot about my students, they want to talk a lot about in the paper or in the presentation about the part that took the most amount of time. Where did I spend the most amount of engineering effort? Where did I debug the most? But the point, to your point about the customer or the user, that's not what they care about, right? It's like, why is it interesting? Maybe, okay, you spent six months debugging this thing. Why is it interesting to me, right? Yes, you solved the hard problem, but tell me why it's useful for me. What's the aha moment for me, right? Or you do like a crazy long demo with many features. So you want to really cut to the USP very soon. Again, this is a trick for writing a good intro for your papers. It's a trick for making a compelling presentation uh, in your pitches as well, okay? And the last part is to tie the, tie the loop, right? Now that you've told me what your silver bullet is, now your silver bullet has to tie back to a happy user, right? The, the original, start with the original user who had a frustration. And here, ideally, you want to make it visually obvious to like a, do a side-by-side -side comparison of like a before and after, right? Same way, if you want to make a graph in your paper, you want to have a side-by-side -side comparison of like why this is better than status quo, right? There's a baseline, I am much better than the baseline. And keep it simple, right? Many, many times you actually worry about or you built a product or you built a tool, we, sh we end up showing like all sorts of like Detailed nuances, third order effects, fourth order features. Focus on the high order bit. Make it very simple, uh, visually obvious with one or two key points. Two, two point, two, one or two key points you want to convey, right? And now, by the way, this idea of like how to make effective demos also applies to any time you want to make a presentation or for a conference talk and so on, right? Any time you want to make a slide. So the, the general rule of thumb is every slide has what I call the hero, right? the hero or the star of the slide and the star of the slide has to ideally be in the title of your slide, right? If you have, it's a takeaway message, it's not in the title, you're already making not sense, right? And people say, oh, I have like a slide called background. Why do I care, right? I was, okay, the, you're asking something about our existing tools don't solve problem X, Y, Z, right? Having a slide called background, having a slide called related work is not very useful, right? Or having a slide called results. Why don't you say what the result is telling me in the title? That's much more compelling. Right? So that's the cool hero of your slide, the message is often in the title and for whenever you're trying to make a presentation, try to draw the storyboard for yourself and ideally make the storyboard, like I said, continuous. Right? It's like visually continuous from frame to frame. It is not like jarring where I use like 
one template in slide one, then the architecture completely changes in slide two and slide three and so on. So if you have to draw the entire slide deck on a whiteboard first, it will actually have like the visual continuity, it will actually be very, very uncluttered and it will actually be a much more compelling presentation where you have internally distilled the essence of your talk before you ever make a talk. So, so next time a paper gets into a conference, right? I hope you remember me and say, hey, let me not use PowerPoint first. Again, eventually you have to make it PowerPoint so that you can share it to other people. But the ideation process of like making the slides, please don't use PowerPoint, get to a whiteboard, try and explain on a whiteboard to somebody with very simple visual, simple block diagrams. I think your, your presentations will be like way, way more compelling, right? And that's sort of the, the, it's called like dog fooding, right? I dog footed my own advice to make these slides because I said like, I don't want to make PowerPoint for this, I'm going to write it by hand. That is my handwriting, that is one, my handwriting on an iPad. It's like, and this is all my slides are, right? And my message got through, I don't need like complex slides to sell my slide. I mean, of course, a technical talk has to have graphs and other kinds of stuff, but think about a visual way of explaining it rather than just putting bullets and text on your slides. The whiteboard medium uh, is a very, very compact medium for making that happen. All right, so that's essentially the cheat sheet for your demo, right? Sorry, one second. So I gave you a cheat sheet for the research processes, a cheat sheet for your any presentation or demo you ever want to give. Start with the user hire on fire problem, identify and articulate the frustration with status quo, explain your aha moment conc concisely, and then show how that made the users or the, the, the problem solved. Uh, that's it. Questions? Yeah. Not really, I think it's the same story. So you should just figure out like a multi-resolution way of your talk, right? So it doesn't matter whether I give you 12 minutes or 13 minutes, you should be able, it's the same formula applies, right? So if I want to give a 12 minute talk, I will not go into the details, right? I will focus on the high level, high order bit story, right? The 30 minute talk or a 40 minute talk is just a, a, a zoom in on some parts of your 12 minute talk. But the high order bits need to be in your 12 minute talk. So you are almost always there is a time constraint. There is no, nobody has like infinite time. So either a 12 minute talk or a 20 minute talk or a 30 minute talk. And these are just like zoomed in versions of these in, in some way. The, the advice of like making a storyboard applies irrespective of how much time you have to make with that talk. Maybe, maybe I misunderstood your question. Yep. 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 Sure, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, great point. So actually, that's a great point. So I would actually say flip the story, right? So for every every piece of work that you ever want to do, there is actually something called the elevator pitch. Start with the elevator pitch. Here is my 30-minute talk, 30-second talk. Here is my 2-minute talk. Here is my 10-minute talk. Here is my 30-minute talk. So don't start by making the 30-minute talk, right? Start by making the elevator pitch. I have 30 seconds. The elevator pitch is literally like I'm in an elevator with a program manager or a, or a venture capital. I have like 30 seconds to convince them I'm doing something cool. So what's your 30 second pitch? Oh, I have two minutes more. I have two minutes. Refine that, right? So starting from the most concise version and zooming in is better than let me start at 30 minutes and then you're saying, oh, I have to cut, I have to cut. I don't know what to cut now, right? I'm, 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 this is like the Mark Twain. I've written a long letter. <laughs> How do I get it a short letter? I think it's easier to go from a short letter to a long letter because you're zooming in on details. And so oh, let me tell you more, let me tell you more, as opposed to, I've written this long letter, tell me the essence of it, right? So, yeah, so, uh, good, good question, right? So, I think, yeah, do, don't cut, I would say, think of like your, any talk you give as like a progressive zoom in, start with a 30 second elevator pitch, so that you're meeting somebody at a conference, you have to give the elevator pitch anyway. That's probably a better way to do it. And the other advice I would actually give is also, when you write these talks, also write for yourself the storyboard or the script, like a story screenplay, right? Write the screenplay for your talk. Write the script, not to memorize the script, but that will help you iron out details or iron out the transitions and the, and the story logic, logic problems and so on. So write a script along with everything you want to say. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat the question? So 
you're saying you, so you, your specific examples you're working in like computer security and you have an attack paper how do i how do i do a story for an attack paper right so yeah so in this case maybe there is not a frustration with the status quo right you actually maybe the story there is like hey you are super happy and my aha moment is an attack right and you should be sad now and then you end with like maybe there are recommendations i mean any good attack paper also gives like recommendations at the other end right so maybe for an attack paper the template is slightly different but the meta advice of like go to a storyboard like say oh this system is used everywhere right everybody thinks it's secure but let me tell you why it's not secure right or oh there are the existing security solutions but they are all terrible because they are not capturing this particular attack that i have created right but uh, good question right i mean this is like a generic template attack papers are slightly different the aha moment is not in solving the problem but in exposing the problem right uh, similar things happen in measurement papers also that template is slightly different where i am measuring a system but even there the aha moment is not like bombard them with like 20 graphs but one or two key findings that are interesting or exciting yeah great question question yeah Uh, so the two questions right architecture and code are two different things uh, so code snippets are harder but again so so here's the cardinal sin of like making a power making a presentation i'll tell you the negative first and i'll get to the positive right so i and i did this too right i put like this text on slide and say oh you don't have to read it so if i didn't have to read it, why did you put it there right so unless the point was this code is very complex and you want to say oh i made the codes much much simpler than the other person's person's piece of code okay then visually you are making a point but if your goal was to highlight my eyes to go to like five lines of code why are the other 40 lines there you might as well just show me the five lines of code and this is the essence of the problem right so uh, any time somebody says oh, i'm i'm putting this wall of text but you don't have to look at it or here is a complex architecture diagram you don't have to look at it to me that's a problem in the presentation methodology itself it's like why do you have to waste the effort of making the if i didn't if you didn't want me to look at it so sometimes the details are in a white paper or a technical document and say go read it there maybe all you need is like hey by the way the details are in this white paper but this is the essence of it so the talk is more like a trailer of your movie the tra- talk is not the movie right the talk is to make go read the paper go read the docs yeah great question though uh, same thing for architecture diagrams too right i have seen like architecture diagrams where there is some party things on the slide and people say oh you don't have to read this and they why are you telling me that right it's like even if i don't read it if i don't remember it why the why the heck are you telling me that stuff right don't don't tell me that stuff any other questions sorry the light is blinding i can't see anybody any other questions okay i think that's it now it's all homework for you so <laughs> hopefully you can internalize some of this advice and tell me if it's useful uh, again i i i find myself repeating this over and over to my students uh, and that's why i said okay let me just make it a slide deck and, and i can share it with more more people and also that my students said this is useful once you made it to a slide deck i said okay now it has to democratize and make it available to everybody so that's why i offered to give this talk to you and i wish somebody had given me this advice 20 years ago my life would have been more efficient hopefully your life is more efficient more efficient than mine thank you come to an end it seems we have reached ours on behalf of the acr office and the alumni relations cell i would like to extend a sincere gratitude to professor vyas shekar for taking the time to share their valuable insights with us today your presence and words have truly inspired us sir We are honored to have Professor Vyas Shekar to grace our event and enlighten us with their experiences and wisdom. Your advice on research and product design and compelling presentations were truly thought-provoking and have provided us with a fresh perspective on the topic. I would also like to thank Professor Mahesh for endowing his valuable support towards the team and the event. Last but not the least, I would like to express my gratitude to the wonderful audience for their participation and interaction. thank you for coming finally i would like i would request professor ayan chakravarty to please hand over the memento to our speaker thank you please a photo of us okay thank you thank you i think they still want us to hold it all right thank you thanks, thanks at all thanks for watching me thank you